the worst thing about being in an accident is that people have so much high expectations of you and they expect that the person that you were before your accident is who they should get. She's got the fire, fire, burning in her eyes. She's so determined just to keep... Hello, 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 hello. Welcome to another video. This is your British Bionic Babe. And as you can see from the title, I'm going to do a little recap. And I'm going to go ahead and take you on a little journey of mine of surviving after an accident. Now, if you're new here, thank you so much for being on this journey with me. To my regular OGs, you guys are phenomenal. I can't say it enough. I am truly humbled and grateful for all your support on all my social medias because a lot of my subscribers are also on my TikTok and on my instagram and i really appreciate the love and support and the encouragement that you guys have given me now let's get into today's video so what i've realized first of all in a couple of my videos is that i think the british accent is going i don't know you guys can tell me sometimes it's really really strong other times it just sound like proper english when i'm you know editing my videos and i actually listen back to the video but anyways it's brain damage. My neurologists have really no new news for me. And so that's not what we're here to talk about. That's another video. So I'm a big birthday fan, right? Ever since I was 16 years old, I celebrate my birthday for six weeks at a time. And so it has been like this every year. And the reason why I actually celebrate my birthday for six weeks in every year is because I have so many different type of friends with so many different type of personalities. And even though in a perfect world, we would hope that we could have one celebration and everybody will come together because, you know, they're celebrating me. We don't live in a perfect world. And so I celebrate my birthday over a six months period, six week period, sorry, over a six week period so that everybody can fit themselves into my schedule or I can fit myself into their schedule. Anyways, in 2019, it was now different. I did my six weeks of celebration and in celebrating, you know, different persons celebrated with me. I went to different events and there was this one event that I wanted to go and it was painted in the grill. Now, I've always wanted to go to painted. I've never been able to go through to, due to finances, due to me having to work or having no drive, you know, the regular stuff. But on June 29th, 2019, I decided that I was going to go to paint it in the grill. Now, as you guys know, I went to the grill. I had a wonderful time. I was driving. I was with three friends. And we were actually in Painted's VIP, but none of us actually drank JB. And that's what was, you know, included in their VIP package. So there was no intoxication for the night whatsoever. And just before I actually left out in the grill, you know, I did the regular Jamaican thing when we do to when we go to a party. I bought the jerk chicken, I bought the juice, I fueled up and I drove back to Montego Bay. Now, out of my three other friends, two would have lived the same area that I lived in and one lived in Greenwood. So when I reached to Montego Bay, I said to them, I'm going to drop off friend at Greenwood because I'm that type of friend. We go out as long as I have a drive to my advantage. I'm not going to drop you at your bus stop unless you have a designated driver that's waiting on you there. Otherwise, I'm dropping you at, at your gate because I'm not the one that's going to drop you in town or drop you to the nearest point. Then sit down by my phone waiting to hear until you reach home. That's anxiety. I don't need I don't need to deliberately put myself in an anxious state. I mean, the things around me already do that on their own. So I said to them, um, I'm going to drop a friend off at Greenwood. Are you guys coming with me? Do you want me to drop you home? They said to me that they are not allowing me to drive by myself. I said, OK, no problem. So if you don't know, if you know, in Montego Bay, we do have an airport. And so in driving to Greenwood, you would have to pass that airport. And when I reached the airport roundabout, I had to stop and let through a truck. And so when I let through that truck, an automatic heaviness came over me. And when that heaviness came over me, it felt like if I blinked, 
the car would literally go into a ditch and it would be in an accident. And so I went around the roundabout and there's a bus stop at the end of the roundabout and I stopped right there and I said to my friends, okay, guys, I'm tired. And so it's either one of two things, either I'm going to sleep or somebody's going to drive to drop a friend off at Greenwood because just one straight road and then wake me up when we reach Greenwood and I'll bring us all back home, right? Now, in the vehicle, it was three females and a male. And one of my female friends said, okay, or male friend can drive. I said to him, have you been sleeping? He said, no. I said, are you okay to drive? He said, yes. He was sitting behind me. And so I exchanged seats with him, yeah? And in exchanging seats with him, I watched him pull out from that bus stop and go to the very first stoplight. Now, in the way he drove, he was very cautious. He was very alert. And you can see that he was young in actually driving because then he 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 mashed that brake way before the stoplight. So, you know, what Jamaicans call a pronto. But he drove very well. He drove comfortably enough for me to feel like I didn't need to go back behind the wheel. So he stopped at the first stoplight. I was okay with that. So I said, okay, let me watch him drive off again. And he drove off from that stoplight, stopped at the second stoplight. And I, in that moment, I was comfortable to continue the journey with him while I sleep. Unfortunately, there was all the plans for me. So that's the last thing that I remembered on my own. Everything I'm about to say is, is, is what I've been given the information or it was shared with me either by the other two young ladies that were in the accident because my friend that was driving, he actually died on impact. Rest in peace, Chris. We do not forget you. We, we remember you all day, every day. And you are celebrated nonetheless. And the paramedics, the firefighters have reached out to me that was first on the scene. The, the vehicle that was in front of my vehicle and the vehicle that was behind my vehicle, those persons have reached out to me and they explained to me what happened in my accident. Because the next thing that I remember talking to you guys even now is that I woke up two days later from a two-day coma in Falmouth Hospital. So what had happened was we were traveling out to like you're going out of Montego Bay because Greenwood is out of Montego Bay and a vehicle was coming on the opposite direction and that vehicle the driver was actually intoxicated and he hit the vehicle in front of all vehicle and that vehicle sped up and then he came directly into the driver's side of my vehicle and that caused my accident when I woke up I was told that I suffered from a broken right hip a broken right pelvis broken left femur and the left femur is the left leg lacerated right eyelid my eyeball fell out i had fractures fine in three places i had a broken right rib i <laughs> i had very severe head trauma which i suffered a stroke and i would have brain damage i woke up immobile so i could not move the only thing i did was i could move my eyelashes i could bat my eyes because then I woke up, I was in a neck brace. I was stationary and I had two metal bars going through my legs in order to keep my legs in place. Now, as I said, when I woke up, I was told I was in the motor vehicle accident. I was told that when I was in this, this accident, my mom said I was the one that actually called her and told her that I was in an accident. She said I dialed the number and I called her from my cell phone and told her that I was in an accident and I hung up the phone. Now, back in the day, when the accident happened, it was a 10-digit code on my fingerprint in order to open the phone. I don't know how I opened it to call my mom. The paramedics on site said to me that there was blood all over my face because my right eyelid was sliced off and my eyeball fell out. But all I was concerned about was saying, um, my friends need help, my friends need help. At that point, I was bleeding and my legs were lodged one into the driver's seat and one into my door. What I remember, and this is why I tell people every day and every time I tell this story and every interview that I do, and even in the book that I'm about to finish writing, I died and I came back and I'm strong. I believe that to the end. And the reason why I believe that is this. After that second stoplight that I saw him pull up to, 
the next thing I remember before waking up in the hospital is I was being pushed really fast on a stretcher in a hospital. Really, really fast. And I woke up and I looked to my left. And when I looked to my left, I saw a man in a white coat. And I knew he was a doctor because of the white coat. And I tried to take a look at his face. But when I looked at his face, it was a really bright light. It was so bright, I had to turn my face away. I looked up. And I could not see anything in the lights above me. It was totally bright, just like the man's face. So I turned my head away again and I turned my head to the right. And when I, when I turned my head to the right, I saw a tall, dark man in a red Oxford shirt. And he had one hand on my chest and one holding my right hand and saying, Dina Ray, don't worry, you're going to be okay. Dina Ray, don't worry, you're going to be okay. And if I see that man today talking to you guys now, I can tell you that was the man I saw the night of my accident. Everybody said to me that did not happen. That man does not exist. They don't know what happened to me. They don't know what I'm talking about because those were not the series of events. So I can tell you guys, there is no tunnel and there is no light at the tunnel, at least not for me. For me, the light was above me. The light was beside me and God saved me. And I'm making no apologies for that. Doctors didn't save me. Prayers alone didn't save me. God saved me in that moment when that accident happened. God is the one that decided that I was supposed to live. He decided that I had some purpose to live for. And the path that I was currently living on was not going to bring me the destiny that he had planned. And so I died and I came back. And ain't nobody can tell me different. So I woke up. I was in the hospital. I did three surgeries before I exited the hospital. I was in there for a month. I was immobile for eight months. Now, we're getting into the meat of the matter of the reason why I'm here to talk to you guys today. Now, I've been driving since 2004. I've had a license since 2004. So, yes, my ass is old. But I've always been a careful driver. I've never been in a position where I've been in a motor vehicle accident. I used to race cars. I used to do drag, according to my journal, because I really can't remember a lot of stuff, people, places, experiences before January of 2019 on my own. But I did write a lot of things. So I used to race cars. I used to do drag racing. I used to be of motorsports club so i'm fully aware when it comes to motor vehicles how to maneuver myself even if i was supposed to be that would be an accident now my independence has been one of the most important things to me for a variety of reasons but some of those reasons are because growing up in my era when i was growing up natural hair was not a thing being a plus size girl was not a thing being dark skin was not a thing when i was growing up your hair needed to be processed to be considered pretty if you were too dark colored you'd have been teased um you had to be high color and even though beauty is in the eye of the beholder when i was growing up a dark skin girl was never considered beautiful and so with all those stigmas that i grew up with and moving into adulthood, it was important to me that I had my independence. It was important to me that I did not deliberately put myself in a position where people that saw me as mediocrity could talk down to me or provide me with any service or treat me or talk to me in any way. So my independence was really important to me. And so I worked hard. I ensured that I could do everything for myself. I ensured that I could finance myself. I ensured that I could do the things that I like for myself. If anybody added to my life in terms of friendship or relationship, it would not be that I'm depending on them for happiness, but they're adding to the happiness that I already created for myself. Now, imagine waking up after being totally okay. You woke up, and I woke up left handed when I've been my entire life. I woke up with an american accent first it went to trinidadian and then went british and it's been british ever since i was immobile for eight months i could not move and my immobile my immobility was so severe to the point where 
when they said once a child i've lived it and it was one of the most additional horrible experiences of my life because on my birthday i was 33 years old imagine being in a position where you're unable to move one you're in a position where it's excruciating pain after pain after pain and you you're not able to take pain management only panadol because you have brain damage and they're still trying to figure out how damaged your brain is i have a wonderful mother and you all know i love my parents to death but my mother automatically took up that mantle and a day in the life of being immobile was my dad coming in, giving me fruits and coconut water in the morning. My mother coming, placing a plastic on the bed, rolling me over onto the plastic, taking off my clothes, bathing me, wiping me off, rolling that plastic, taking it off, dressing me, dressing my wounds. I had to have two, three people take me out of bed, put me in a wheelchair, bring me to the doctor, take me out of a vehicle, bring me to the doctor. Can you imagine some of my doctor offices had staircases? You had two, three, four people holding me in a wheelchair because I'm not light. I'm a thick girl holding me and pulling me up staircases to see my doctor. My entire life changed. And when I woke up, I was in total depression. I was depressed. I was suicidal. I tried about two, three, four to kill myself but hey god said no it's not my turn now as an accident survivor there's a lot of things that i do or did and still doing in order to survive this traumatic experience but the first thing that i had to do was to accept the fact that i was in a motor vehicle accident I had to accept the fact that my entire life has taken a 360 degree turn and there was nothing I could do about it. I had to accept that I made the right decision and a bad thing happened, but I had no control over that because I didn't have a conversation with God before and he told me, okay, this is going to happen. So this is what you need to do. I made the right decision out of being the person that I am out of the judgment that i did as a human being because then um, i was traveling with three other persons i could have pushed and said okay i'm gonna keep my eyes wide open i'm gonna turn my window down and i'm gonna drive and drop my friend at greenwood but i didn't and i didn't know that chris had a license i didn't know chris could drive i really had made up my mind to sleep for 30 to 45 minutes right down the street and then go ahead and drop my friend home so the first thing that you have to do as a trauma survivor of an accident is you have to accept that the accident happened. You have to accept that the accident happened. You have to accept that the accident happened to you. And you have to accept that you lost something in that accident because with every traumatic experience, you lose something. Unfortunately for me, it was my entire life. It was a part of my brain. It was friends. It was finances. It was livelihood. So that's the first thing of coping is acceptance. The second thing is going through the stages of grief. Because when you go through a traumatic experience, losing something, you have to grieve about so it. So the stages of grief don't only apply to when you lose a loved one to death. It applies to every traumatic experience that you went through. And these are the stages of grief. And you have to take your time, be patient with yourself and go through each of these stages because only then can you truly accept the life that you now have as a survivor you can't spend your days wishing what was you can't spend your days trying to recover to get back what you already lost it's, it's gone 
And that was one of the hardest things for me. I spent two years of my recovery trying to regain what I had instead of trying to accept the fact that it's gone. It's never coming back. And it was a good life. Now I need to make the life that I'm currently living just as great or greater because now I have more purpose. I have to walk in purpose, live in purpose, talk in purpose and function in purpose. Do I know what that purpose is? I do not. But I just hope that the things that I'm doing are preparing me for whatever it is that's supposed to come along the line. And one of those things is drawing closer to God because then do I have a reason not to? If it was not for God, I would not have been able to survive that accident. I would not have been able to talk to you guys today. And so that, got, that puts me into point number three. When you survive an accident, yes, the doctors are there. Yes, your support system is there. Yes, people are there and a the team is there to ensure that you do your surgeries, you go to your checkups, the nurses take care of you, but before everybody else, it's God. So whether or not you believe in a supreme being, the fact that you were in a motor vehicle accident, something that take away your life, and you live to tell that, that tale, I'm not, I'm not forcing you to believe in it. I'm telling you that God is real. And if at any point you doubt that, every day that you get up, do you, do you think it's science? Whether or not you think that, I really don't care. Because I believe in God. I believe that there is a supernatural higher being than human form that wakes me up every morning, that saved me from that accident, that allows me every day the strength that I don't give up. Now, a fourth thing that I use to survive after my accident was journaling. Now, yes, I'm not an avid reader and I'm not an avid writer. But what I realized is that a lot of people after my accident, they came around and they said things like, I don't know what to you, or they said, um, I don't know what you're feeling, but draw closer to God. One of the worst things you can, you can say to somebody that's been in a motor vehicle accident, and it's so severe, like anybody at all, any traumatic experience, it's good. Okay. We know it's going to be okay. We don't need to hear it every day. You get what I'm saying? That doesn't comfort us. It does not comfort us in any way. You consistently asking us about the traumatic experience doesn't provide any comfort. You consistently asking us about our recovery does not provide any comfort. Talking about other things that are happening in the world, taking our mind off what we're currently going through, that's what provides comfort. But I didn't have that. A lot of people that were around me, a lot of my support system, consistently say these things. One thing that hurt me to the core were the people around me that said to me, focus on your physical recovery right now. And your mental it will work itself out. Let me tell you guys something. And this is what all traumatic experience is. The most challenging part of a recovery is the mental state. It's not the physical state. I can always learn to walk again. I can always learn to run again or not. And even if I can't physically move, technology is putting itself in a place where it can assist me to walk again. But when you have brain damage and when you feel like killing yourself and when you're in a depressive state to the point where everything you see around you is a black and you have no idea how to get out of that depressive room, how can you then say, focus on your physical recovery because your mental recovery will deal with itself it did not deal with itself i tried to kill myself seven times after my accident i didn't tell anybody i didn't let anybody know i just did 
and it never took it never took and a lot of people would say if you really want to kill yourself it would happen I wanted to kill myself because it was i living for all my life i've wanted to be a mom and my accident has now made that incredibly hard on top of my age i moved from being totally independent to totally dependent and as an over 30 year old do you really want to be going through life depending on your parents? i prided myself on being a thick dark skin fluffy girl with great skin and my accident has left me with hyperpigmentation discoloration and a lacerated eyelid that for god believe me it took over half my face i don't feel beautiful i didn't have any point to live and i tried to end it but god said it was not my time so the fourth way i used to help survive after my accident was journaling i wrote down all the feelings I wrote and I wrote and I wrote and the more I wrote even though the book was not talking back to me I felt a sense of freedom I felt a sense of relief it was a non-judgmental space I just wrote my feelings they were not in any chronological order I just wrote what I felt in that moment and that is the thing that tried to help me and that is what helped me to deal with these people around me that keep saying focus on your physical recovery everything's gonna be okay give thanks to god that you're alive listen journaling it works you may not like to write you may think that writing it down somebody's gonna see it i had all those reservations as well but to be honest with you, after trying to kill myself seven times and it was not working, that frustrated me, first of all. So what harm is it going to be to me if I something different? And my something different was journaling. And in doing that, I also made my own journal. Of course, you guys can check the link in my description and you can get your own copy. But journaling works and after you after you journal and after you you know you write how you feel and you go back to those entries that you made you can literally see for yourself your growth of how you taught before and how you're thinking now and that helps you in surviving your accident as well you see your personal growth and you're at the point where you said, I didn't think this day would come. And then you didn't realize that it was here until it, you know, reality hit you in the face. Now, the fifth thing that I use to survive as an accident survival is finding ways of living in my new normal. Because after I've, accepted the, after I've accepted the accident, accepted the changes in my life, I don't just want to live. I just, I just don't want to exist. I want to live. And in living, I now have to find things that are conducive to this new life that I have. So some of the things that I used to do before, I can no longer do them, does not mean my life has to be boring. It means that now I have to do some introspection. I have to now see the things that I like and that I don't like. I now have to see, you know, what new things am I going to get into? Because now, you know, I was immobile. Even when my immobility became less and less and I became more mobile, there's still some things I can't do. I'm a great swimmer, Vincent from four years old i used to compete locally so i love to swim and best believe it swimming is the only exercise that i can do because talking to you guys today a girl still has a broken leg well we're gonna fix that this year 2023 it's gonna be my year but you have to now be comfortable with trying new things i know change is not all friend it's not my friend either i don't like change but it's necessary we don't like it but it's necessary and 
these changes that we're making, we're not making it for other people, we're making it for ourselves. Because we have to regain how to love us now. We have to learn how to love ourselves for who we are after an accident victim. We have to love the scars because the scars are not a reminder that our life has changed. It's a reminder that we've survived. It's a reminder of how we're going to connect the dots in our new life to make it as fabulous as the life we had before. It's a reminder that God chose you even though we don't like it. God chose us and we have a purpose. And a lot of things that I used to enjoy and a lot of things that I used to like doing, like going to parties and being in large crowds and all that. Yes, I like to party, but now if the party doesn't have a VIP or a special area, I'm not going because I am not going to run the risk of somebody pushing me down. And then again, I'm no longer a party fan. So with the brain damage, and I'll talk about that in a a lot of things have changed and the worst thing about being in an accident is that people have so much high expectations of you and they expect that the person that you were before your accident is who they should get now. Again, that's in another video. But as an accident survivor, these are the first things that I went to in order to, you know, get back to some sort of normalcy or what I thought was normalcy because you will, will never be normal again. But in this new normal, we can learn to adapt to different things and we can change a lot of things because it's all right. I mean, we survived a motor vehicle accident or you survive a traumatic experience. Whatever it is that you have survived, you survived it. You have your own miracle story. But it takes time to be in a place where mentally and physically you're ready to talk about it. You're ready to talk about it, feel it and move on from it. And that you may inspire the people around you, that you may continue to inspire yourself. So guys, this is where I'm starting this one. I have a lot to give you, but I'm starting with five. So these five are things I'd love for you to try. Whether you were in a motor vehicle accident or you were going through a traumatic experience and you lived it. Because do you think this is my first trauma? No, baby. It is not. But it is my most lasting traumatic event. But one thing about all the trauma that I've been through, the mental parts of it is the worst. And I'm still dealing with that. And funny thing is, I thought I've dealt with all my trauma, the mental aspects. But my accident and my brain damage has allowed me to realize that all I did was bury them under a rug. Because they all came resurfacing to the top and aided in my suicidal thoughts. Now, I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm just a newly disabled Jamaican woman with a little bit of insight and speaking from personal experience. And so the tips that I'm giving you is what has worked for me. It may or may not work for you, but I'm no gatekeeper. So I'm going to share it with you guys. So guys, thank you so much for being on another video with me. This is your British Bionic Babe. And remember to like, comment subscribe i would really like to know if you guys like what i'm doing right now because i mean we've seen the sad story we're over the sad story as you know i'm going to be going to record for quite some time because we do have an eye to fix we are still fixing the teeth and the jaw and we still have a left femur to actually fix but apart from that we're over the sad story it's now about living in the new normal. And I'd love to hear what you guys want to hear from me. I mean, I'm still going to do the vlogs because, you know, I have to have enjoyment in my new life. So, guys, thanks so much for being on another video with me. Give it a thumbs up if you loved it. And I will see you guys in the next video. She's got the fire.